This was Korea at the end of World War II, a country liberated after 40 years under Japanese domination and looking forward at last to peace and freedom. Most Koreans had never known what it was to live in a free country under a government of their own. But for the very young, the prospects of such a life seemed bright. Theirs was to be a free Korea. At the end of the war, the heads of three great nations of the world, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, had guaranteed that Korea should be a free and independent nation with a government of its own choosing. A geographical line in Korea, the 38th parallel, divided the United States Army's area from that of the Soviet forces after Japan's surrender. The Russians were to accept Japanese prisoners north of the line, the United States to the south. But this arbitrary line was to become a symbol of strife and division, for the Soviet Union wanted complete control of Korea north of the 38th. In Seoul, a joint United States-Soviet commission met to reach agreement on unification for Korea. But the Russians blocked every attempt to solve the question. It became clear that Russia was not interested in a free and united Korea, but only in bringing Korea under Soviet domination. The United Nations General Assembly, at the request of the United States, took up the problem and appointed a commission to supervise free elections throughout the country. But Russia excluded the UN Commission from the part of the country it controlled. When Korea's election day came, therefore, it was limited to the region south of the 38th parallel. But on May 10, 1948, South Korea's people, two-thirds of the country's population, voted, electing freely and fairly a national assembly to establish a constitution and a national government. Five days later, the Republic of Korea was installed with Syngman Rhee as its president. The United Nations recognized it as the lawful government of the area in which elections had been permitted and as the only lawful government in Korea. A self-ruled Korea began to work for prosperity and security. Growing industries helped the country toward economic as well as political independence. Koreans north of the 38th parallel, hearing of liberty and prosperity below the line, came in thousands to the new Republic of Korea, fleeing the autocratic communist regime established in the north by the Russians. This so-called People's Republic was modeled on the other satellite states under Soviet sway, and its luckiest subjects were those able to escape, like these fugitives, to the south. The newcomers found a land of rich, broad fields where a hard-working people were moving toward economic stability. Korea, after its long bondage, was taking its place among the world's free nations. Then came war from the north, unprovoked and without warning. In June 1950, the North Korean communist forces launched a bloody, costly, destructive invasion. Quickly, volunteers answered the call to defend the Republic of Korea against the aggressor. By the hundreds of thousands, they enlisted to serve in the ROK Army. With this army, hastily equipped but courageous and determined, the two-year-old Republic of Korea attempted to stem the long-planned, well-organized communist onslaught. But the Republic's forces were pushed back steadily. The first and most tragic victims of the wanton communist attack were the civilians of the Republic of Korea. Men, women and children driven from their homes and their livelihood by the aggressors. Here is part of the price the aggressor exacted. The United Nations Security Council, Russia absent, quickly voted to order the aggressors to halt. When the UN order was ignored, the Council, again without Russia, asked member nations to supply military strength to repel the Red Aggression. A United Nations army to fight side by side with the Republic of Korea against the communist invaders began to take shape. 
United States troops stationed in nearby Japan entered the conflict, and soon others joined them. The Republic of Korea was not to be alone in its struggle against aggression. From the corners of the globe, the free nations began to send men and material for this unique army. The first international military force in history created for the sole purpose of repelling aggression. The member nations of the UN were answering the Security Council's call for armed strength to help Korea, and 16 nations sent armed forces. Britain, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Belgium, Colombia, Ethiopia, France, Greece, Luxembourg, Thailand, Turkey, the Union of South Africa, the Philippines, and the United States. 32 others contributed food, equipment, medical units and supplies, merchant shipping, and other assistance. Each gave what it could. From these many nations, with their varying backgrounds, cultures, and languages, came a unified United Nations effort and its unity lay in common adherence to the principle that no aggressor shall be permitted wantonly to attack and invade a peaceful, lawfully governed nation, however small or weak the victim may be. UN force gathered strength, and after being outnumbered and pushed back at first, gradually began to seize the offensive. A daring amphibious operation at Incheon cut the communist supply lines. Now united action, the free world's answer to communist bullying, was beginning to take effect. The United Nations were on the move. The UN troops, forced into a tiny corner of Korea in the war's first months, had liberated much of Korea three months later. And the Korean people, young and old, recognized them as friends and liberators, in contrast to the invaders who had stormed through the land such a short time before. Between the fighting men of the world's free nations and the victims of aggression, a warm understanding sprang up. of youngsters like this one, homeless, orphaned, ill-clothed, often starving. That was what the United Nations were fighting for. They fought to prevent those rights from being threatened ever again. UN forces advancing with extraordinary rapidity moved into Seoul in September 1950. Though the Reds fought desperately to hold Seoul, destroying great areas of the city with fire and explosives, the capital of Korea was liberated. flag of the United Nations, symbol of unity against aggression, flew above the battered capital. North Korean Reds began surrendering in droves. The Red Indian Army was disintegrating. Once captured, many of the prisoners showed no desire to return to the slavery of life in communist North Korea. They were amazed to find that their captors treated them like human beings. Then communist China in January 1951, openly joined the war against the Republic of Korea and the UN. When the Soviet orbit flung this great war machine into the battle, a new act of aggression had been committed. The Republic of Korea and the United Nations fought to repel this new invasion. But once more, as in the beginning, they were outnumbered. They were forced to fall back before the onslaught of the Chinese hordes, which the communist leaders, utterly reckless of human life, threw into the conflict. A bloody new chapter of the war had begun. 
In the months that followed, once again the pitiful groups of refugees were spread out across the land. Yet another invader was driving them from their homes. For the Korean people, exhausted by successive waves of marauders, the dream of peace, prosperity, security, and self-rule seemed more remote than ever. But the United Nations forces rallied again and thrust back the new attackers. The tide of war turned once more. For these gains, the free nations paid a frightful price. More than 25,000 United Nations soldiers died in the three-year Korean War. More than 100,000 were wounded. For the communists, the toll was even heavier. At Kaesong in July 1951, a series of truce talks began. Under pressure of military setbacks and of rising world opinion, an agreement to negotiate had been won from the communists. The first expression of communist consent to discuss peace came directly from Moscow, not from the Chinese or North Korean puppets. For the free world, the talks were frustrating. They were characterized by deliberate delays, haggling, and petty arguments by the Reds. The UN negotiators displayed two qualities most needed, goodwill and inexhaustible patience. Often it seemed the North Koreans, their Chinese communist accomplices, or perhaps their Russian masters, did not really want peace. The question of repatriation of prisoners of war finally became the greatest obstacle to a truce. The Red negotiators insisted that any truce require all captives to be returned to their own countries by force if necessary. Given proper medical care, decently clothed, housed and fed, and sensing what freedom could be, many of them did not want to be sent back to their communist-ruled native lands. The United Nations held to the humanitarian principle that no prisoner should be repatriated against his will. The prisoners were permitted to express their choice, whether they would elect to return to communism or whether they would rather be set free to go where they chose in case of an armistice. Many chose freedom. Over the fate of these men, the truce talk stalled. Meanwhile, the war went on. It had settled into a more static conflict, with much of the fighting confined to artillery duels and air bombardment. The UN had stabilized the front at a point north of the 38th parallel. Suddenly, at Panmunjom, the Reds proposed in March 1953, as a solution to the prisoner problem, that captives unwilling to return home be turned over to a neutral nation. This was almost identical with a plan rejected months before by the Reds when put forward by India. But it was acceptable to the UN, for it did not require any prisoner to return unwillingly. The exchange of ill and wounded prisoners started in April 1953 was the first tangible progress toward a truce, the first evidence of possible good faith on the Reds' part. The United Nations returned to the Communists all ill and wounded prisoners who wished to go. While the wounded were being repatriated, truce negotiations went on. At last, an end to the war seemed possible. At Panmunjom on July 27, 1953, in this conference hall, the fighting was brought to an end. After three years of conflict and two of negotiations, agreement had been reached. It was an agreement upholding the principles for which the UN had fought. These were the main provisions of the truce which you are about to see signed. All hostilities were to cease within 12 hours of the signing. A military demarcation line was drawn along the battlefront, which at the time of signing ran close to the 38th parallel. 
Each side was to withdraw all troops with their equipment one mile and a quarter back from the line within 72 hours. Any increase of the number of troops maintained by either side in Korea was forbidden. A military armistice commission composed of five UN and five communist officers was established to carry out the terms of the armistice and to police the two and a half mile buffer zone. A neutral nation supervisory commission composed of one officer each from Sweden, Switzerland, Poland and Czechoslovakia was set up to check ports of entry into Korea. All prisoners desiring repatriation were to be sent home within 60 days. The others were to be placed into the custody of a neutral nation's repatriation commission made up of officers from India, Sweden, Switzerland, Poland and Czechoslovakia. For 90 days, the communists were permitted to send representatives to persuade, if they could, the unwilling to come home. The persuading was to be done in the presence of neutral officers and a UN officer. The fate of captives still reluctant to return would next be discussed by a political conference. If the conference failed to agree on their disposition in 30 days, the prisoners were to be released to civilian status. In the armistice, both commanders recommended that a political conference at high level be held within three months of the signing to settle the problems of Korea. Now Lieutenant General William K. Harrison of the United States signs for the United Nations. And North Korean Lieutenant General Nam Il signs the document for the communists. The truce was an accomplished fact, though fighting was not to cease for 12 hours. Through those last 12 hours, up to the final minute, the war continued. The United Nations had made an honorable armistice. The truce did not assure world peace or peace forever in Korea. But the UN forces and the gallant armies of the Republic of Korea had accomplished the objective to repel the aggressor. And the truce gave the world and Korea a chance to work for permanent peace. The armistice maps show the terrible futility of the North Korean and Chinese communist invasions of the Republic of Korea at enormous cost to themselves, as well as to Korea and the United Nations, they thrust across the 38th parallel. Now the truce line finds them halted nearly where they started, even losing some territory. The lesson is this, the world will no longer tolerate aggression. The guns are silent in Korea now, and Koreans are returning to their homes. Again, the hope of a peaceful, secure existence rises in their hearts. As they rebuild their homes shattered by war, they look forward once more to being citizens of a free, unified, self-ruled, prosperous nation with busy factories and productive farms, undarkened by the shadow of the invader. These things Korea will have if the free world, rejoicing in the end of bloodshed, nevertheless remembers the lesson of Korea, that although aggressors might strike ruthlessly when and where they think they can succeed, the United Nations, standing together, can and will repel any such aggression. In the Korean War, the world was given a pledge that never again can an aggressor attack his neighbor with impunity? The would-be aggressor of the future will think twice and remember Korea. <laughs>